Hi everybody, if you don't know me, my name is Cody Harrell and I teach journalism and English at East Lansing High School. And today I'm here to talk to you about Zoom, just about kind of how it works, about what the software looks like and ultimately what's important for you to know when it comes to hosting and being part of a meeting. So I'm gonna start by just showing you how to make a Zoom call, how to schedule one, ultimately just how to get yourself in the position to do so. So first, you're going to need an account, which makes sense. So if you go over to an internet browser, I'm using Google Chrome, and you go to zoom.us, this is the company that makes the product. Um, and over here in the top right, you can see you can sign up to make your own account. Now, I'm not going to necessarily go through this whole process with you. Um, it's one, I don't want you to know how old I am, but rather uh, because I think you have made accounts on your own, you know how to do this. The one thing though that I will stress is that you are going to want to use your school email. So for me, I use cody.harrell at elps.us. And in doing this, it allows you to uh, use a different link to sign up for educational uh, unlimited time if you wanna have longer than a 40 minute Zoom call, which is the limit. And I'll provide a link for that in the description. But uh, once you've made your Zoom account, it's either going to tell you to host a meeting or join a meeting, but one of the things it's going to prompt you to do is to download the app. I already have the app on my computer, and this is a Mac, but on it, it'll open up the application, which looks a little something like this. So now I'm just going to show you how you can schedule and set up Zoom meetings. Let's say that you have a group that's ready to go right now. You don't want to schedule it. You just want to jump in. So you're going to click this new meeting button right over here and it's going to show you me. Um, it's also going to show you, because right now it's trying to test your computer, your audio, and your, uh, your video. So I'm gonna click Join with Computer Audio, and you'll know that this is working correctly if one, you can see yourself on the screen, uh, but also if you can see this little green microphone bobbing up and down, which means it can hear my voice. If it can't, if something's wrong, if you click over here on this little arrow right here, it'll show you where it's getting the inputs to make this video. So the microphone is the same as the system, so it's pulling my Mac audio or maybe pulling my headphone audio. And then the speaker is the built-in output, which are my headphones. So if I were to hear anything, it would come through my headphones. And then we've also got some further audio settings. Um, at this point, you may want to just contact Zoom or contact someone at the high school who's really familiar with it, or you can just email me. I might be able to help you. I'll put my email in the description as well. But from here, once you've got yourself accustomed, you know how this is going to work, you can start inviting your friends or your students or whoever. Um, and what you're going to want to do is click this participants button right down here at the bottom. So over on the right, maybe, or as a pop-up box, you're going to see the participants. And down here in the left, you're going to see the invite button. Now, there's a lot of different things you can do here, but I'm going to just suggest that you copy the invitation to your clipboard because the easiest way to schedule a Zoom meeting is via email. So what I now am going to do, I'm going to pull up this email that I already had prompted, and I'm going to invite our two guests on our call today who are Mr. Neil who is an ESL teacher at the high school and the middle school, and Mrs. Kaufman, who is an English teacher at the high school. Um, I've sent the email to them. I've got my subject, join my Zoom, and then I am going to put uh, what copied to my clipboard, and what copied to the clipboard is a link they can use to directly join the Zoom meeting, or if they wanna join the Zoom meeting, which you'll see in a later part of the video, um, how you can use the meeting ID and the password. Now, you are required to have a password for all your Zoom meetings, and what this is going to do is also make a waiting room, but I'll show you what that looks like a little bit later. So once I've done that, I'm going to send off my email and they're gonna get it and probably join my call. Um, but another way, and I'm gonna just end this meeting to show you, let's say you didn't wanna do it now, but you wanted to schedule it for later. I'm gonna end this meeting. So let's say that you wanted to schedule a meeting for later. There's another function out here called schedule. So what this will do is it will allow you to schedule a Zoom meeting. So let's say I want to schedule a Zoom meeting with my um, yearbook staff or my English classes. So um, now remember, according to the district policy, you have to send this to the parents of the students um, and not directly to the students, or you can maybe include both, but you, the only thing you can't do is send it directly to students. Parents do have to be involved in the process. So I'm going to call this the yearbook weekly Zoom call. 
I'm going to schedule it for Tuesday at 2 p.m. That's when they wake up. Um, and then if I want to make it recurring, I can make it recurring. And then you're going to want to set the time zone to Eastern Standard Time. Um, this will allow you to use a personal meeting ID or generate one. I like to just keep the same one. And then you have to have a password. You can make a different password for a different group. I usually just keep it the same. And then it'll make it so you have a couple of options. Uh, the host will automatically have on video as well the participants when they join. And then the audio can be telephone, computer audio, or both. If, for example, I wanted them to call in, um, I could select a specific country or region that they could call in for, but I'm not going to worry about that right now. Um, and then from here, there's a couple different calendars you can set up. So um, we, of course, use Outlook for, our, uh, for East Lansing. Um, for the district. You can use Google if you want to. Um, I have iCal because, you know, I have a Mac. Or if you just click other calendars, which I tend to do, um, and I schedule the meeting, what it will allow me to do is, again, copy this invitation. And what this does, if I copy the invitation, if I want to send this to anybody, I can open up another new email. So bear with me. Um, and in this new email, I'll send it to whoever I want, and then it will show that there is a weekly yearbook Zoom call, um, April 21st, 2020, um, at 2 p.m. And then from the Power Teacher function, you can go in and take all your parent emails and student emails and put them here in the two. This also works the same for any internet email browser. But uh, what's just important for us is that knowing how to invite someone into a Zoom call and make sure that it works. Okay, so now we are in the call, and our job now is for me to kind of show you what it looks like when you're the host of the call. So a couple of things to just get you started. Again, I already showed you what it looks like for the mute and the stop video. One thing that's important about those is that those only affect you. They don't affect anybody else in the call, so you can mute yourself or stop your own video if you need to step away. But there's also a couple other functions in here that are important. First, we have our participants, which we'll come back to what that looks like in just a moment. But as you saw before, it allows you to invite other people. We have the chat function, which allows you to talk to other participants via your keyboard. And then we have a share screen function. Um, you can also record your Zoom calls if you want, but I know district policy says not to record your Zoom calls. And then we've also got these reactions, which we'll get into from the viewer side of things. But Right now, we're just waiting for Mrs. Kaufman and Mr. Neal to join our call. As soon as they do, they're going to go into the waiting room, which I'll show you what that looks like after the hosting side of things. But as soon as they try to join the Zoom call, which should be any second now, um, you're going to have the opportunity to let them in the call. This is important because not anybody can just join your Zoom call. They have to have, again, that code and they have to have that password. So now um, they're in the waiting room, which you can see right here. We can click see waiting room and I can admit them both individually. So now I'm admitting Ms. Kaufman and Mr. Neal. And when they join the call, they're going to join with their audio and their video on. Right now I can just see Mr. Neal and I can't see Mrs. Kaufman. Um, but what I can do is that up here, you see this little gallery view. Um, if you click gallery view, then you can see everybody. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the call. So you can either have, again, that speaker view or the gallery view. I personally like the gallery view. But um, once you've gotten into here, so there's a couple of different things that are important for running an efficient meeting. So usually I like to start the call about five minutes before the official time has started and let students join the call um, just to give them some time to socialize and say hello to each other, just like the couple minutes before class would start. But then I tell them that as soon as you know our time starts, maybe with a minute or two extra, um, we're going to get started with the meeting. So now one of the things that you'll notice, and I'm going to ask Ms. Kaufman and Mr. Neal to unmute themselves. One of the things that you can do when it comes to this call is uh, it's important that when you give them the time to talk to each other, that when the meeting is supposed to start, that's when you become in control of the audio. So in this participants right here, there's this button called mute all. Now, I also like to allow the participants to not unmute themselves because I like to be in control. 
So when I do that and I click that button, it, uh, it mutes everyone in the call. Um, and they can't unmute themselves. If they try to, it'll say the host has to unmute them. Um, you can also from here unmute all. Uh, and there's also a couple other things that you can do and you can activate, but I'm not gonna worry about those. Um, so I like to mute everyone and then give my announcements. Now, when I give announcements, I like to one, establish kind of the meeting rules and expectations. I like to talk about dress code. I like to talk about that we can see everything in your screen. And so if there's things that I probably shouldn't see, you should probably, you know, take them out of the call. Um, but I also like to show students or anybody else how the program works. So in order to run an efficient meeting, because I've muted them and they can't unmute themselves, it's kind of confusing as to whether or not they have questions. And if I have like 50 people on a call and they don't all fit on one screen, they can't just raise their hands and I'll see them. So one of the cool functions of Zoom is the raise hand function. So what I like to teach them to do is down at the bottom, so we've got our participants here. If they click that button as students, um, that there's a little button that's right around here where around that invite mute all button is that allows them to raise their hands. So when they do, I can see down here that Mr. Neal raised his hand and then Ms. Kaufman also learns how to raise her hand. And what you can do, if you can see everyone in the call, when they raise their hand, you can lower their hand for them just to show that you have noticed them and then you can unmute them. And Mrs. Kaufman, what do you wanna to say to the people? And then when she's done, you mute her, um, so on and so forth. You can unmute Mr. Neal, and then what do you have to say? Same. So after that, once you've unmuted them, now one of the other ways that you can kind of see how this works, I'm gonna ask them to raise their hands again. Um, so ultimately, let's say you have so many people that you can't see all the raised hands, because um, you can have usually up to 100 people in a call. One thing, if you open up this participants function, um, what this allows you to do too is see who has their hand raised and it puts the people with raised hands at the top of the list. So I'm gonna ask Ms. Kaufman to unraise her hand. And what you'll see is that when she does, she goes below Mr. Neal. Um, so I can only see the raised hands. And then from there, even in this right here, you can lower hand and unmute if you don't have the person um, and so on and so forth. But this is a great way to keep track of the conversation and keep track of who wants to jump in. Um, another thing I like to teach them how to do is how to use the chat function. The chat function is great because the chat function allows them to ask questions while you're giving instructions or while you are doing your lesson, if you're gonna use this platform. So let's say that I'm you know, giving instruction and I'm talking about this assignment they're gonna do this week and Mr. Neal has a question. Um, and he doesn't want to interrupt me, you know, because he knows that I'm very important. And so instead of interrupting me, what he's going to do is he's going to type a question. Um, and any second now, that question should pop up right here in the chat function. So when I click it, um, what are the instructions again? I wasn't listening. Huh, typical. So um, if that's the case, if they weren't listening and they need the instructions again, um, you can either say, I'll get back to you in a moment, or if you want to type back in here, um, you can type a response to them. However, one of the important things about responding between students and teachers, as the district has directed, um, you can only respond to the entire class. You cannot send a private message to a student. That is not kosher. So please only when you have, and you can see that because right down here, it will say to everyone. Now, what's really important with this, let's say that Mr. Neal wants to send a private message to me, which I can tell that he's doing right now. Um, one thing that you'll notice in the chat function is that when he sends me a private message, let's say that I go to respond to that message. So that private message is gonna pop up any second now. So yep, right here, it says to me privately. Um, and if he's too shy to, to talk about it, you know, Mr. Neal gets shy sometimes. But if that's the case, uh, what's important is that down here, it will automatically set this to Mr. Neal privately. Um, you can't respond privately to students. So what you're gonna wanna do is click this and then select back to everyone. And then you can respond um, and say, don't be shy. I wouldn't actually handle it that way, but just so you know how to use that chat function. Um, and then 
You can also teach students about these reactions down here, which I talk about a little bit later too, but if a student agrees with something that you're saying, um, or if you wanna just check in and say, did that make sense to everybody? Can you give me a thumbs up? Um, if they don't have, like if their thing is covered, they can press this little button and give a thumbs up. You know, once you've had your meeting, once you've unmuted people and given them their space to talk, um, one thing I like to do when I end the meeting is go back to the participants function, and I like to unmute everyone and give them a chance to say goodbye. So if I unmute everyone, and they can all, all say goodbye, and they can hear from each other and talk to each other. So one of the things that you can also do, uh, let's say that you want to share what you're doing on your screen or you wanna share something that you're working on. You have like a document that you have set up. So down here next to the chat function, we've got our share screen function. Um, and when you pull this up, you're gonna see a number of different options. It'll allow you to share your desktops so like what you're seeing right now. And then it'll also give you a couple different options of what you might want to bring up. So let's say that I want to um, share my computer, uh, like my, my files, I could click on this and what it'll allow me to do is it'll open up whatever that function is. Um, or if I have an internet browser, I can click that. Um, or if I just, let's say I wanna just like kind of talk something out. There's this cool whiteboard function. So if I click on whiteboard and I share, it'll open up a little whiteboard for me and then I can draw things and I can show them how much I love them. Um, or I can just kind of, you know, draw whatever we need to to communicate that. Um, once I'm done sharing my screen, I'll press stop share. So now let's say that I want to share a video with the class or I want to show them some YouTube video and we can all watch it together. So under that share screen function, um, I'm going to see right here my Google Chrome. I've got my video ready to go. Now, before I do that, though, I want to make sure that I'm sharing my computer sound and optimizing the screen share for video clip. Um, if you don't do that, what's going to happen is that students either won't be able to hear or they'll hear the audio come through the computer, through the microphone, and then into their ears, which doesn't sound very good. Whereas if I share my computer sound, the audio goes directly from the input of my computer through their screen. So I'm gonna share this video and they will see it. Uh, and then when I press play, They're hearing the audio from my computer. They're not hearing it through my microphone. Um, however, you can play audio and talk at the same time. Just be aware that the audio level that's coming through their screen is directly related to the program you have open. So if I wanna talk over this video, I'm gonna actually turn down the audio pretty low on YouTube, and then I'm gonna play it. And they can hear the audio, but they can also hear me a little bit. So this is important for you if you want to play a video or show them, or let's say you just want to play some audio for them. If you share your screen, there's this advanced tool called share computer sound only, and I'm going to share that. And then they're not going to, they're going to see this screen, but I'm just going to press play on some audio and they're going to hear just a little bit of audio come through. I don't know what it is, but it's playing. So, um, this is how you can share your screen and show them what you're working on or work on something together. Now, let's say you have an agenda for the meeting, you can pull that up, share the agenda, etc., etc. Now I'm going to show you what the participants side of Zoom looks like. This is important either if you're going to be a participant or if you just want to know what your participants are going to see. So first, Mr. Neal sent me an email to join his Zoom. So this is what my email looks like. Now there's a couple different parts of this email that are important. The first one is this link. Now this link will automatically send me to his meeting, but let's say that I don't wanna click the link. I already have Zoom open. You can just go to a join Zoom meeting and then type in this meeting ID. Um, or again, you could just click this link. Um, now, one thing that I'm gonna do really quickly because I know that I like to forget things, I'm going to copy this password and then I'm going to click join Zoom meeting. It's gonna open up my web browser, which is going to prompt me to open up the app. Now you have to open up the app because you can't hold Zoom from your web browser, but now you can see me and I'm going to join the call with video. I could also join without video, but um, I get this little preview dialogue to make sure that my camera's working. So I'm gonna join with video. Now, 
the meeting host is going to let me in soon, which means that the meeting has started and it's Mr. Neil's Zoom meeting, um, but he has to let me in. Um, so now one of the things that I did notice is that it didn't prompt me to type in the password. However, it provided me one. Uh, if you join from the app, it'll ask you for the username and the password or the meeting ID and the password. But now I'm just gonna sit tight and wait for Mr. Neil to let me into the meeting. And now it looks like it's gonna let me in. So when you join, it allows you to join with your computer audio, which I'm going to do. And now you can see me. Um, you can also see what the participant side of Zoom looks like. So one thing I like to do is right up here in the top, I like to make it full screen to eliminate distractions. Um, but let's say that since Mr. Neil is running this meeting, um, let's say that I wanted to just pay attention to that one person, because right now I'm in gallery view. Um, I could turn on speaker view, which would just show me the person who is talking. Currently, I'm the only one talking, so it's just going to show Mr. Neil because he's the host. But I'd also want to go back to gallery view just to see how everybody's doing. Now, from the participant side of things, just a couple things that we talked about in the other video that you're going to want to know about. So again, this mute and stop video down here uh, allow you to affect yourself. You may want to teach students about the mute and stop video just in case they need to step away for a moment. If they're going to step away to, you know, go to the restroom or whatever, um, encourage them to leave their computer there uh, and also to just stop video so that they don't have to worry about what's happening on the screen. Um, also encourage them to just stay muted unless you're going to mute them yourself. Um, that raise hand function that we talked about is right here. They click participants and then right here in the bottom, you can click raise hand and that's how you raise your hand and you can lower it. Next to it is that chat function that we talked about. It looks pretty much the same as the host zoom function or chat function. Um, and in general, you know, one of the things that's important is that let's say that when a student tries to join the call and their audio or video isn't working, um, you know, troubleshooting from this side of things actually helps a lot. So making sure that down where it says mute, um, there's this little button next to it, which they can click, and it'll allow them to see what microphone they're using and then what speaker is being used. So currently I'm wearing headphones, and so the speaker is the built-in output, which is my headphones, and the microphone is the same as the system. Um, I could also make this built-in microphone an external one. Um, and you've also got, you know, test speaker and microphone, leave computer audio, and then audio settings. So which will open up a number of different parts of Zoom that not a lot of people need to look at, but this will allow you just to um, help your student figure out what's going on. Um, so ask them to click that button and then, you know, seeing what's going wrong there. Uh, it also will allow you to select a camera or if you want to change your background. Um, now, it's important that, you know, students can change their background to anything or your participants can. I wouldn't tell them they can do that, um, but if they figure it out, you know, you can always just um, from a host side, you can stop their video um, or you can just ask them to leave the call or you can boot them from the call if you want to, if they're being inappropriate. Um, but that's basically what, from the participant point of view, you're going to see. Um, one of the other parts of participant view that's really cool, uh, so let's say that Mr. Neil's talking about something that I really like and that I agree with. There's this button down here called reactions and I can give a thumbs up. Um, let's say that he is, you know, spitting some mad rhymes and I appreciate it. I could give him some claps. Um, unfortunately, those are the only two, but they're both positive. So that's what's important. Uh, other than that, that's pretty much what the participants will see. Mr. Neil, Ms. Kaufman, am I missing anything? Crushed it. Well, um, and if a student needs to leave, I always tell them they don't need to announce it, like they don't need to unmute themselves, they can just put it in the chat and then they can leave. And when you choose to leave the meeting, it'll ask you again just to make sure, you know, for those of us that are indecisive. And then there you go. Um, the other way that we talked about, you can join, let's say if I go back to that email that I had up, um, I've got this meeting ID right here. Uh, and what I can do is I can, you know, if I go to this, to the Zoom app, I can press join, I can put in that, put my name, and then it's going to ask me for the password. 
And that's when I copy and paste the password. And then I can join the meeting again. Um, I'm not going to, but that's just kind of what that looks like. Uh, so hopefully that was helpful for you.